Hey everyone, so today I'll be talking about machine learning. Uh, this was a topic that just came to me. I was hoping we would do a CS Saturday on it, but that never happened, and I kind of wanted to learn about it because it's such a high-level idea, and I feel like to kind of get a basic understanding of what's going on, you kind of have to drop to a simpler level. So when I was trying to do my research on it, I was thinking about just talking about applications and things like that, but I really wanted to try to get an idea of you know what's going on behind the scenes and how these things work. So I'm going to try and introduce this at a basic level and kind of hope you guys reach the same conclusion. So Arthur Samuel, who we would consider the founding of machine learning, gave us a super helpful explanation saying, field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Uh, it's not very helpful. Uh, it doesn't really teach us anything because it is literally in the phrase machine learning. Uh, so we know machine learning from all its applications, uh, things like beating humans at things we're good at. Uh, like IBM Watson winning at Jeopardy or beating Bobby Fischer in chess, um, to simpler things like just Netflix recommendations, uh, there's Siri recognition, there's um, like facial recognition software, things like that. But there's also more important applications. So there's like autopilot navigation software. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of Two Sigma, but uh, they, a couple of MIT professors left MIT to start a hedge fund called Two Sigma, where they use machine learning technology to gather data from the stock marketplace uh, and generate returns. In their first year, they generated like 34% returns, which is just bonkers impressive. Um, they don't do that every year, so like don't, don't like be calling them up. It doesn't work like that. Um, but it can also be used for a lot more important things, like it can be used for medical diagnoses, for taking data from past cancer patients and helping to make the probability of what a new patient of what their um, current diagnosis is, or for other things like deciding if something is a hot dog or not a hot dog um, for seafood. So typically as programmers, we think in the way of we have an input, we have a desired output, how do we write a function that gets us from A to B? Uh, and that's all fine and good, but for machine learning, it works the opposite. We want to give a machine a lot of input and output, a lot of x and y values, so that they can generate that function from it, or an algorithm. So we can do this in many ways. There's linear regression. There's decision trees. There's neural networks, Bayesian networks, and Markov chains. Uh, I know Jackson already spoke about neural networks, and the other two, I like even just a simple Wikipedia lookup, I had no idea what was happening. So for today, I'm just going to start out, and we're going to talk about linear regression. So as I said, this is what an input function output would look like in our eyes. Very difficult function here. But mathematically, that would just look like y is equal to f of x, with e being the error term, which I'll get to in a second. So to get this, we're going to have our x and y data. So this, for my example, I'm just going to use a stock market example. Uh, where you have a given risk and we're expected to have a certain amount of return from that risk. Uh, this is not how this works. Don't go trading based off of this. It's just arbitrary. Uh, but given a certain amount of x values of like past amount of risk for different stocks and y being the amount of return, we can graph it out like this. So this machine learning with the linear regression is by taking this and creating an algorithmic expectation of what future values would be. So by giving it a lot of x and y values, we call this training. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be one x input. This can be multiple x inputs. So if we go back to an example that I'll get to later, where we're classifying beers, we'll say it's going to have different features. Like it's going to have an alcohol per volume. It'll have a color to it. Uh, it'll have a certain hoppiness to it. So those attributes are very helpful for deciding what sort of beers that we're going to get from that y result. So by giving it a lot of this data, uh, we want to get the most accurate output as possible. So we want to get give it features that are not only good quality, things that are relevant, uh, but also a lot of them so that we can understand what we're going to get out of it later. So now, if we give it a lot of features that are super unhelpful, like if we give the type of glass to our beer, that's not going to be helpful. Or if we give the weather outside, that's not going to help us either. And we call that overfitting. Uh, so that means that what we're getting out of this function is um, we're getting a representation of data that is too attached to each um, data point. And for future recommendations, it's going to take, take data that's not important to us and try to use that to make a decision based off of what a classification we're trying to do. 
And then on the opposite end of that, we have underfitting, which is we're not taking into account enough about the data. So if we didn't include alcohol per volume for our beer, that's a pretty deciding factor, and that would help us give a very probable expectation of what kind of beer we're trying to classify. So it's important to have a good balance between not only a lot of data um, being passed into this, but quality data that's going to be helpful to us for reaching our desired end. So here we have our Goldilocks zone. It's just right. Uh, this obviously isn't like a perfect function, um, but it's a better representation visually of what this would look like. So another way to do classification is I'm going to talk about decision trees. And I'm going to go back to this example we had earlier. So we're going to have a lot of X training data, um, which is for each of these three types of beers, we have IPAs, we have brown ales, and lagers, we have 100 of them. Uh, for each of them, we're going to have an alcohol per volume content from 3 to 13. We're going to have a color from 0 to 10, 10 being the darkest, and a hobbiness of 0 to 10. So we have this huge data set, and through that, we want to get the most probable answer for this test case we have up here, which we've given uh, an 8.1 alcohol per volume, we've given it a color of 4, and a hobbiness of 9. So this is kind of what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, so it'll go through our favorite data structure, binary trees. Uh, and it'll be, so it'll ask a question, something that's going to help get rid of a lot of data at once. So it'll be like, is alcohol per volume less than 4.0? Because every single data point in this table that has that feature less than 4 is a type of logger. So we can immediately say it's that. Well, our example isn't that. So let's go to the right. So now we have 250 samples left. Is it greater than 8? And in this case, it is greater than 8. Is the color greater than 8? And it's not. So we've, by doing the color test, we've eliminated those brown ales that are separate from it, and we're slowly whittling down what sort of expectations we want to have for what our test case is going to be. So now we're at, is the happiness greater than 8? It is. So we have 10 samples left that all have those attributes, and they're all IPA, so we can reasonably expect that this beer we've given it is going to be an IPA. So obviously, this is a very simple example of this. Um, it really, it's not very helpful um, because when we're trying to do things like that are much more complicated, like cancer diagnosis, we're going to have a lot more data points. Uh, we're going to have to have the most accurate probability as possible with the minimal error term. So it's important to choose data that's important uh, and relevant, but also a lot of it so that we can reach the best um, diagnosis in this case possible. So to kind of review, this is the kind of flow chart of machine learning in a case. We'll have a bunch of training data that we've given it. So we've given it a lot of beers, each with their end output. Uh, and then that'll go into our data set. And through that, we'll create a model. In this case, we created a binary decision tree. Um, and through that, we can use, we can create a prediction based off of a new input data. So going back to the example of the care certain patients, if we have all that data from past patients, we can take that person, you know, what is their age, what are their past diagnoses, and put that into our prediction table to try and give us an accurate prediction of what their situation is. And that's why it's so useful and why it's so important. So I hope this has helped everyone. Um, I know you didn't expect maybe more math statistics into it, and neither did I going into it. Um, but it is, from an outer perspective, a way to understand you know, what's going on under the hood, how do we make these decisions, and how do computers take all this data and give it to an output that we need. Thank you.